for joining us for our Wednesday night Bible study. And I would like to say that if you're a born again Christian, one day your life is going to be interrupted by trumpet blast. I want to read a couple of verses of scripture uh, in beginning in the New Testament as we begin our study tonight concerning Jesus in the Feast of the Trumpets. Now last week we were looking at the first four of the seven feasts of the Lord in Leviticus 23 and those four spring feasts have been fulfilled at the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking at this feast tonight, the Feast of the Trumpets. I want to read in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. And so Paul told us about the rapture here, that the rapture was a mystery. And he says that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. And then there's another passage that Paul gave us in, about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians. In chapter 4, he says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So if you're a child of God and you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, this subject of the rapture, it, it should be a comfort to you because it's going to be a resurrection and a reunion with all of those who have died in Christ. All of our loved ones before us who have died in Christ will be resurrected. We'll be caught up together with them uh, to meet the Lord in the air. Tonight as we look at this Feast of the Trumpets, it's the fifth feast uh, in this series of seven here in Leviticus chapter 23. And this feast begins in verse 23 through 25. Now I, I want to just say that this feast is the next feast uh, to be fulfilled. Uh, it points to the next major prophetic event on the horizon, which I believe to be the rapture and resurrection of the saints in Christ. Now the interesting thing about these three fall feasts that we've already mentioned last Wednesday night is that they have not been fulfilled at any point in history so far. They are all awaiting for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the very next unfulfilled feast on God's prophetic calendar is this Feast of the Trumpets that we're going to be looking at tonight. Now the interesting thing is this, the reason I'm looking at this feast at this time is because uh, in 2020, this feast will begin at sundown on Saturday, September the 18th. Now, the Jewish calendar, uh, sundown on Saturday, the September the 18th, will actually be September 19th. Their day begins at sundown, and so uh, September 19th and 20th is the two days that have been set aside for the, the Feast of the Trumpets in 2020, and so it's going to start Saturday at sundown on our September the 18th, and it will go till uh, Sunday the 20th uh, and end at sundown. 
And so it's just right around the corner. And so that's why I'm so excited uh, to teach what I'm teaching tonight. And I, I just want to say, as I said last Wednesday night, I'm not uh, setting a date for the rapture. I'm not saying that the rapture is going to happen on those days, however it could. Uh, but I, I just want to look at this feast because uh, uh, it, it is a, a biblical uh, passage that needs to be expounded today. And, and I will say that it's, it's, it's fair to say that the Feast of the Trumpets is probably one of the most debated feasts in terms of its fulfillment. Now, there's no debate on the Passover. I mean, all Christians agree that it was fulfilled when Jesus went to the cross as the Passover lamb and the feast of, of unleavened bread when he was buried. His, his perfect body was laid into that grave, uh, buried. We, there's no debate that Jesus fulfilled the feast of unleavened bread when he was buried. And then the feast of first fruits when he rose again uh, from the dead uh, as a first fruits of all those that would be resurrected. And uh, so there's no debate on that. There's no debate on the Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, which was fulfilled in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit was sent down uh, from heaven to indwell and empower the church of Jesus Christ. However, this Feast of Trumpets, there, there's, I would say there's some debate as to how it's going to be fulfilled. Is it the rapture uh, of the church that fulfills this feast, or is it the regathering of Israel at the end of the seven-year tribulation at the second coming of Christ to earth? Well, I will say that there is a trumpet blast, not only in those passages that I read you in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, that refer to the rapture of the catching up of the saints to meet the Lord in the air, but there's also a trumpet blast, a great trumpet blast, it says, uh, in Matthew 24, 31, which speaks of the end of the tribulation when, when Israel is going to be gathered, uh, uh, regathered, and, and Jesus is going to come to save all Israel. And so there's a trumpet uh, blast involved at both of those events, the rapture and his second coming uh, to the earth. But I think it'll become clear as we go through uh, some truths about this feast, both in the Bible and both in the Jewish tradition, that all point towards the rapture. And one of the key phrases, I think, that settled it for me was this phrase, the last trump, uh, that Paul uses of the, the speak of the rapture, uh, in contrast to the phrase, the great trump, or the uh, great trumpet uh, that's used in Isaiah 27, 13 to speak of the regathering of Israel, and that phrase, great, is also used in Matthew 24, 31. Now, we'll talk more about that uh, later on in the message, but I want you to turn your Bible first to Matt, uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus 23. Uh, this is the main chapter uh, giving... Uh, instruction on all of the feasts in chronological order. And the last feast that was fulfilled that we talked about last Wednesday night is the Feast of the Pentecost. Uh, it was fulfilled uh, in Acts chapter 2. And, and that's covered, uh, that feast is covered in verse 15 through verse 21 here in Leviticus chapter 23. Now the Feast of the Trumpets uh, begins in verse 23. Uh, 23. Uh, and so I want you to notice something. I don't know if you've noticed this in your Bible, but verse number 22. Let's look at verse 22 because it's a verse that's inserted between the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of the Trumpets. In my Bible, verse 22 has one of those paragraph symbols, meaning it's a new paragraph. And, and so, it, it, and then you come to verse 23, a paragraph symbol, a new paragraph. And so I want you to understand that uh, I want you to ask yourself the question, why would God put this verse, insert this verse, between these two feasts? I don't think it was accidental. I think God put it there with a purpose, and I want to explain why after we read it. 
It says, and when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Now, what's so significant about this? Well, uh, I want to just say that just going back to the third feast, the feast of the first fruits, remember we talked about uh, that was the beginning of barley harvest. They bring the first fruits of the barley harvest and, uh, and bring them to God in that feast. Uh, and it was a promise of a, a more harvest to come. Now, the, the fourth feast, the last one fulfilled, was the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, it is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. The first fruits of the wheat harvest. Now, I want you to think about this. There's about three to four months, I think it's about closer to four months, period, between the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of the Trumpets on the Jewish calendar. And during those four months, is the main harvest. It's the summer harvest. Because remember, Pentecost falls sometime in May. And the Feast of Trumpets falls uh, September, October. And so you've got four summer months of the main harvest. And so this verse here is telling us that, that as they're reaping the harvest of the land during those four months, he said, be sure to leave. Don't gather all that falls down. Don't gather that, that on the corners, but leave those for the poor and to the stranger. Now, why is this in here? And, and I, I think you need to understand that the word stranger is referring to Gentiles. It's referring to those who are, who are not Jews. And so God places this between the Feast of Pentecost and Trumpets uh, you can take it as general instruction that God cares for the poor and God cares for the stranger or the Gentiles. Uh, you, can, uh, you can take it as that, and, and it does uh, speak to that truth. However, considering that this chapter is prophetic in nature, that it's looking for or it's foreshadowing something uh, in the future that Christ would fulfill, I believe there's more to this verse than the obvious. I believe that God has placed this little verse, verse 22, between the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets because he is indicating what he was going to be doing in this gap of time between these two feasts. And so prophetically, I want you to think about this, prophetically this gap in verse 22 it speaks of the church age, which began at Pentecost and will conclude at the Feast of the Trumpets. Now, let's follow with me. What is God doing in the church age? I want you to think about that very carefully. What is God doing during the church age? Well, we know that during the church age, the gospel is going primarily to the Gentiles. Now, first, it's, it went to the Jews. Romans 1.16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it is the power of God unto salvation unto the Jew first, and also to the Greeks. And so I want you to think about, in Acts, you will see that the church of Jerusalem, the gospel began to spread among the Jews, among Jerusalem, Judea, but then it ultimately it went out to the Gentiles. Now, Paul wrote about that in Romans chapter 11, verse 17, how that as a whole, the nation of Israel, they were blinding and blinded in part. They were set aside so that the gospel could go to the Gentiles and so that the Gentiles could be grafted in. Uh, and so I want you to think about that. Paul writes about that in Romans 11, 17. I'm not going to read that, but for time's sake. But in Acts 15, 4, at that council of Jerusalem, Simeon, uh, James points out uh, in Acts 15, 14, Simeon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And so right now, God is taking out a people for his name from among 
the Gentiles. Now recall this. Back in Genesis 22, 18, God told Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. In the seed of Abraham, who's, that, who's thy seed? Singular, it's Christ. In Christ, who would be coming through the lineage of Abraham, he says that he is going to bless all the nations of the earth. And so the gospel has gone out to the Jew first, now to the Gentiles, and it's going to continue during this age of harvest until the fullness of the Gentiles uh, be come in. And that's a Romans 11.25. Write that down and go read it later. Romans 11.25, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so with that, so we're, we're right now, we're in verse 22 prophetically. We're between the Feast of the Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets being fulfilled. We're in this age of the harvest. Now, I want you to note something very, very interesting that I found. In John 4, 35, when Jesus, after he had won that woman at the well, that Samaritan woman, he told his disciples in verse 35 of John chapter 4, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. What I found interesting, it says, Say not ye, there are yet four months. And there are four months right here between these two feasts. I found that so interesting. And, and you know, uh, I, I think all can agree. All Christians would agree with me. All uh, that study the Word of God would agree that during this church age, which we are currently in, we are to be involved in harvest work. In other words, we're to be preaching the gospel to all nations, to every creature, bringing the loss to Jesus Christ. Now what's interesting, after this sermon harvest that we see here in Leviticus 23, which pictures the church age, the Feast of the Trumpets is the next feast that signals that moment for all the workers of the harvest to come home. Now let's, let's read this. Beginning in verse 23, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And so I want you to notice here that that when the Feast of Trumpets begins in the first day of the seventh month, I want you to notice it's to be a holy convocation. This word convocation we talked about last Wednesday night, it means a uh, calling to, out of an assembly. Uh, uh, and so it's a calling together for an assembly, which I see as an allusion to the rapture, because the rapture, what's going to happen is all the saints that are all over the world laboring in the harvest fields of the world, they're going to be called into this holy convocation in the air, and we're going to go up to heaven, and we're going to rest uh, from our labors. Now, I love what Zola Levitt, a Jewish believer who's now with the Lord, this is what he wrote. The trumpet was the signal for the workers to come into the temple. The high priest actually stood on the southwest parapet of the temple and blew the trumpet so that it could be heard in the surrounding fields. At that instant, the faithful would stop harvesting, even if there were crops, and leave immediately for the worship service. That's exciting. I, I just love that. I mean, to think about that this next feast signals that last trump, the calling up of the saints into the air to meet the Lord, uh, uh, we're going to stop the harvesting at that point. So I want you to think about this. Think about this. We're in the time period right now where to harvest souls, and, and our time is, is getting short. We don't know when that day is when the Lord's going to come, but listen, it's getting short when He comes, when that last trump sounds. Listen, all of our work is going to be over. 
Uh, we're not going to be able to win any more souls. We're going to be taken up to heaven. So we better do our work today uh, and do it well. Now, if you study this, these verses that we just read here, Leviticus 23, verse 23 through 25, it becomes clear that God didn't give the whole game away concerning the Feast of Trumpets in this passage. Uh, apart from just stating uh, the day uh, being the first day of the seventh month, uh, it's going to be commemorated by blowing of trumpets, not much else is given other than the fact that uh, there's going to be uh, some sacrifices, uh, an offering uh, made by fire unto the Lord. And so we have to look elsewhere. We have to look to other scriptures and even to some Jewish traditions that point us uh, to uh, what this feast is all about. And I want you to turn now, if you would, in Numbers, in Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Now, I don't have time to read these 10 verses, but I want you to turn there because I'm going to point out four things or four reasons for the blowing of trumpets. Now, in, in this passage, God told Moses to make two trumpets of silver. He said that in verse 2, uh, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. Now, I want to point out something, that the silver trumpets were used at the temple. They were used... Uh, on the feast days. However, uh, I read that the shofar, which is uh, what I was blowing, the shofar is a ram's horn, was used during the feast of the trumpets. And uh, so the shofar uh, is, is blown, the trumpets are blown. We're going to learn for four reasons here in this chapter. Number one, if you'll look in verse 2, he says that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly. And so the first reason that the trumpets would be blown was to call an assembly together. And so to call the people out to come to assemble. Now, I want you to think about what the rapture is going to be. When, when that trumpet's blown, what's going to happen? The dead in Christ are going to rise, and then we which are alive... Uh, and remain are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds. There's going to be an assembly of all saints in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so that's interesting. Uh, there's another reason why the trumpets would sound. Uh, also in verse 2, that last phrase, and for the journeying of the camps. In other words, when they would, uh, while they were in the wilderness, uh, during the time of Moses, when it would be time for them to, uh, to get ready to move to a new destination, they would blow the trumpet. And so I want you to think about that second reason, to set out to a new destination. They would blow the trumpet. Now, the rapture, <laughs> believe it or not, is going to be a new destination for believers. We're going to be leaving this earth, this sinful earth, and we're going to be taking up our destination in heaven in our Father's house. Just like Jesus promised in John chapter 14. Now there's a third reason the trumpets would be blown. And that's found in verse 10. Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days. And in the beginning of your months you shall blow uh, with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and so on. And so basically the third reason would be in times of, of rejoicing and times of the Sabbaths and the feast and uh, so on. And I want you to think about this. The rapture is going to be a time of rejoicing for saints. Uh, we're going to go to that marriage feast in heaven. We're going to go to that marriage in heaven with the Lord, uh, who is our bridegroom. And so uh, that's interesting as well. But there's a fourth reason given here uh, in verse 9 uh, for blowing the trumpets. If you go to war in your land against an enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets. And ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. And so here, uh, uh, to blow when war is about to begin, to blow an alarm. And I want you to think about this. After the rapture, what takes place? There's going to be a seven-year period of tribulation. The Antichrist is going to rise up on the scene. Uh, he's going to make war against uh, Israel at that time. Uh, he, there's going to be... Uh, 
the Lord Jesus coming with the saints at the end of that seven year period to make war with all nations. And so this trumpet's going to be blown in preparation for war as an alarm. And uh, so this is very interesting. Now, now I want to look at some names. I, I wish I had time to give you more information, but I'm going to move on. Uh, there are some names that the Jews use for this piece of the trumpets. Some different names that, that tell us a lot about this piece of trumpets. And let me give you an example. You know, at Christmas time, there are, there are different names for Christmas time. Uh, we call it the birth of Christ. Uh, we call it the first advent or advent season. Uh, it's called the nativity. Uh, others have called it yuletide, the 12 days leading up to Christmas. And so there are different names we use for the holiday of Christmas. Well, the Jews had different names for the Feast of the Trumpets. And the first one is taken right here from uh, Leviticus 23 uh, in verse 24 where it talks about a blowing of trumpets. A memorial of blowing of trumpets. Now this phrase, blowing of trumpets, is the Hebrew word teruah. Teruah. T-E-R-U-A-H. Teruah. And so they call this Yom, Yom, Y-O-M means day, Yom Teruah. And so this is one of their names that the Jews gave to this feast, Yom Teruah. And Teruah means, according to uh, reputable uh, Hebrew dictionaries, a blowing of an alarm, a sound, uh, a trumpet, a shout, or a blast, uh, of alarm or, or of joy. And so the ancient Jews, they called this feast Yom Teruah. And, uh, and uh, it could also be translated this way. If you translate Yom Teruah into English, it could be translated the day of the awakening blast. The day of the awakening blast. Now, that's so interesting because the Jews had this belief I'm talking about Jewish rabbis here. Uh, they had this belief that the resurrection of the dead, they believed, would occur on Yom Teruah. Hmm, that's interesting. And this awakening blast is the sound that is said to awaken those that sleep. In other words, those who have died, raising them to life. Now, one of the great passages they refer to is Isaiah 26 and verse 19, where it says, Thy dead man shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise, awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. And so this, this word awake here in this passage, speaking of awakening of the dead, the resurrection of the dead, uh, they believe, the Jews believe, that this would occur on Yom Teruah. Now, I want you to compare that with what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall then descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So what's going to happen at the rapture? There's going to be a resurrection. A resurrection of the dead in Christ. And we read that also, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. In other words, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Wow, that is amazing to think about. Yom Teruah, the day of awakening. Uh, it could easily be referring to the rapture of the saints. Now, I want to talk about this phrase, the last trump. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, at the last trump. Now, many today, they look at that and they say, oh, we need to find the last trump. And so they'll go to the book of Revelation, and they will look in chapter 11, in verse number 15, and they think, oh, that's the seventh trump, 
trumpet that's going to sound. And, and so they say, that's it right there. That's, that's what Paul's referring to. But I want you to think about something. Revelation was not even written when Paul wrote those words in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. I do not believe for a moment that Paul was referring to that trumpet at all. It just, it just would not fit uh, the prophetic picture for one thing. But uh, I want to just say that in, in the time which Paul wrote, the Jews, how they, they, we don't find them asking Paul, what do you mean by the last trump? Please explain that to us. You have to put yourself in the culture in which Paul wrote. It was the uh, culture uh, actually before the temple was actually destroyed in AD 70 that he wrote 1 Corinthians. And so I want you to think about this. There is, in that culture and time, the phrase last trump was used to speak of the last trumpet that was blown on the feast of the trumpets. It was a very well-known phrase to the Jews in that day. They all knew when Paul said the last trump, they knew what Paul was talking about. Because let me just explain this. I'm going to do it as quickly as possible. On the Feast of the Trumpet, on that day, the first day of the seventh month, there would be a hundred trumpet blasts on that day. There were three rounds of 30 blasts. Now, there were four different uh, trumpet sounds, and I, I'm not going to have time to go into those four different trumpet sounds uh, tonight. But there would be a series of 30 different trumpet blasts, three series of 30 trumpet blasts, and so that's 90 sounds, right? And then there was a final, like a staccato of nine trumpet blasts, followed by the last trump. The last trump was called Takaya Pagadola. And, and this meant the, the great or the big Takaya or the big trump, the last trump. And, and so I want you to think about this for a minute. It was well known among the Jews that on the Feast of the Trumpets, the first day of the seventh month, there would be a hundred trumpet blasts, the last one was called the last trump. It was the last opportunity for repentance. Because back in the Jews' time, this, this feast, the next feast was the Day of Atonement. And so the, there were ten days from the Feast of the Trumpet to the Day of Atonement. Ten days of awe, they called it. Ten days of awe, A-W-E. And so during those days would be time of confession of sins and repentance leading up to the Day of Atonement. That was how the Jews celebrated it. And so the last trump was the last opportunity to get things right, to repent, get things right with God. And so that's very significant that when Paul said at the last trump, what's he referring to? Most likely, he was referring to this last trump on the Feast of the Trumpets. Now, I want to contrast that the regathering of Israel at the second coming uh, if you'll look with me very quickly in Isaiah 27. In Isaiah 27. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13. Uh, this verse is talking about, uh, you, you see in verse 12, that ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel, and it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown. So here he calls it the great trumpet. That's in contrast to the last trumpet. In Matthew 24, uh, in verse 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now here he's talking about the gathering of the elect of Israel. All Israel is going to be saved, as Paul said in Romans 11, 25. And so Matthew 24, 31 is not the rapture. This is the second coming when the great trump is going to be sounded uh, and they're going to gather all Israel together according to the prophecy in Isaiah 27 uh, in verse 13. So that's different. The great trump is different than the last trump. The last trump was the last trumpet that was blown on the feast 
of trumpets. Now, here's an interesting thing that the Jews believe that the Feast of the Trumpets, uh, during the Feast of the Trumpets, that uh, the gates of heaven would be opened. And, uh, and they, they believe that on the tenth day, the Day of Atonement, that the gates of heaven would be closed, uh, that there would be no hope of salvation. And so that's, that's very, very interesting to me. And uh, it kind of alludes to Revelation 4, 1, when John said, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be thereafter. Now this is a, a type of the rapture. Uh, when Jesus comes, heaven's going to be open. There's going to be a trumpet sound. There's going to be a shout. Uh, the shout's probably this come up hither, and we're going to be caught up together uh, in the clouds of the Lord. So Yom Teruah, the day of the awakening blast, it points, it points to the rapture. Now there's a second uh, name that I want to share with you that they use at the Feast of the Trumpets, which is probably the most common one that's used today, is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year. The head of the year. In other words, the beginning of a new year. Uh, the seventh month would be the month Tishri in the Jewish calendar. It was the first day of their civil calendar. So, so whenever uh, the Feast of Trumpets comes on September the 19th uh, this year, uh, the Jews worldwide are going to be wishing each other a happy new year. That's the truth, because it's the beginning of the new year uh, for the Jews on their civil calendar. And uh, now they had a religious calendar as well, which uh, first Nisan uh, was the first month of their religious calendar. And during the 14th day of that month was Passover, so that was in the spring. But I don't want to confuse you, so uh, let's go back to this first Tishri, uh, the seventh month. It, uh, it, it's actually the first month of their civil calendar. And the Jews believed that, that on Rosh Hashanah, that it was the day that Adam and Eve were created. And so they celebrated it uh, as the birthday of, of Adam and Eve and uh, I thought that was interesting and if that is true uh, think about this on Rosh Hashanah which is the Feast of the Trumpets is when creation story uh, started when Adam and Eve were created the first creation and think about the rapture is going to be uh, when the church will experience the full reality of the new creation uh, in heaven. And so another interesting truth about uh, Rosh Hashanah is that when Noah uh, was able to open the door of the ark and to see the new world post-flood for the first time, according to Genesis 8.13, it was the first month, the first day of the first month, which would be Tishri. And uh, I've looked it up, and everybody agrees that Tishri, it's referred to Tishri, uh, which would be Rosh Hashanah, uh, the head of the year. Uh, it's interesting, because I want you to think about that, that, that when the waters receded, they went into a new world, uh, began, a new beginning, if you would, a new year, uh, a new world. And so this is uh, a type of... Uh, Resurrected believers seeing the new world, heaven. And so again, this, this points us to uh, the rapture, this, this word or phrase that they use, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. Now let's talk about one more. There's, 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 there's about five, but I only have time for three. One more, Yom Hakesa. Uh, Yom Hakesa uh, is... Uh, a word I want to explain that they use, a phrase that they use uh, for the Feast of the Trumpets. It means the hidden day. And uh, that's what Yom Hakesa means, the hidden day. 
Now think about this. The Feast of Trumpets is unique among all the feasts in Leviticus 23 because it occurs on the first day of the month, which you remember on the lunar calendar, that's on the new moon. Uh, Passover occurs on the 14th of the month, which is during the full moon. And so there's a big difference here. And so I want you to think about this. Uh, they would be watching for uh, that little thin sliver of crescent of moon, the new moon. And that would begin the Feast of the Trumpets. Now in Ezra's day, this feast uh, began to be celebrated over a two-day period uh, because it was really uncertain on which day the new moon would appear. Uh, they didn't want to celebrate it on the wrong day. And so it became known in Ezra's day as the hidden day, Yom HaKesha. Uh, and so they even, the Jews even believed that that day was hidden from Satan. And concerning this feast, the Jews would typically say this. Now I want you to listen to me right now. The Jews would say this about the hidden day. Of that day and hour, no one knows. Yes, that's what the Jews would say about the Feast of the Trumpets because they would be waiting for the new moon. It could occur between uh, one or two days. And so uh, they, would, they, would, they had a saying of, of that day and hour, no one knows, Yom Hakesa, which means the hidden day. Now, does that sound familiar? You know, in Matthew 24, 36, Jesus said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man know, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What Jesus did is he took a saying among his own people, among Jews, that used up the Feast of the Trumpets. You know, I believe the celebration of this, this Feast of Trumpets, year after year, is a prophetic rehearsal. Remember, we, we looked at that word rehearsal coming from convocation. A rehearsal of that hidden day. And so every year at the Feast of Trumpets, it's a, it's a dress rehearsal for the hidden day of the rapture. Because Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour uh, that the Lord would come. And, and he just tells us to be prepared and watch for his coming. And I believe that there's no way we could watch if we did not know the season in which it would come. Now, I want you to think about this. After the Feast of the Trumpets, we know that, which foreshadows the rapture of the church, which I believe. I'm not going to be dogmatic, but I believe that. Uh, the next feast is the Day of Atonement, which foreshadows the second coming of Jesus, the Messiah, at the end of the tribulation. And, and that's when uh, he's going to save uh, all Israel, uh, according to Romans 11:25. That's when all Israel is going to look upon the Messiah whom they have pierced. Zechariah 14 speaks of that in his prophecy. The final feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, which foreshadows the millennial reign of Christ, when God's people are going to recognize what God had always attended, that intended, and that is that he would want to dwell or tabernacle with his people. You know, during the millennium, Jesus is going to tabernacle with us. He's going to dwell with us. And so these seven feasts, they give us such a clear portrayal of, of, of God's prophetic picture. Each feast is part of a comprehensive whole. Collectively, they tell us the prophetic story of Jesus Christ, His first and second comings. You know, the purpose of this lesson tonight is not to set a date for the rapture. I'm not doing that. But it would seem to me that God has divinely pre-appointed days so that we can know when to be watching and to see if it happens on that day of the Feast of the Trumpets or if it's just another rehearsal. Wouldn't it be great if it's the real thing this year? You know, I want to just share with you in, in, as we conclude. In 1 Thessalonians 5, after Paul talked about the rapture, he said in verse 1, But in the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Verse 4, he says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, 
that that day should overtake you as a thief. Verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So Paul says, The times and seasons, brethren, you have no need, I write unto you. They knew about the times and seasons. They knew about the feast of the Lord. Let me just say this, that Jesus, he only comes as a thief to a dead church. Take time to go read Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. That church, the dead church, he came as a thief to them. In Revelation 3, 14 to 17, the church at Laodicea, he, he, he comes as a thief to the lukewarm church. You know, Matthew 24, that parable of this evil servant in verse 48 through 50, he came as a thief to that evil servant. Or Matthew 25, 11 through 13, he came as a thief to the foolish virgins, the five foolish virgins. What I'm trying to say is, is that for those of us who are saved, he said that day should not overtake you as a thief. You are not in darkness. We need to watch and be sober. It only overtakes those who are not prepared and not ready and not watching. And so it's very, very important tonight as we conclude this Bible study to make sure that you know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. To have assurance of your salvation. If you don't have assurance, I invite you to come to Jesus tonight to put your faith and trust in Him. He died on the cross as the Passover lamb for your sins. He was buried and He rose again the third day. He's alive. He's a living Savior and He's coming again. The only way for you to be saved is put your faith in Jesus to trust His sacrifice for your sins. Christian, Tonight, we need to be prepared. We need to be watching. That trumpet's going to sound. While we're watching, we need to be laboring in the harvest fields of the world. We need to be sharing the gospel with our loved ones, with our friends, with our neighbors. We need to be giving the faith promised missions and spreading the gospel throughout all the world. And you know what's so interesting? This blows me away. Our mission conference here at Bible Baptist Church in 2020 starts Friday night, September 18th at 7 p.m., which is after sundown. And listen to me. That night begins the Feast of the Trumpets. <laughs> wow. And, and our conference goes through Sunday night. And so our conference this year is going to take place during the Feast of the Trumpets. And, and a reminder of what we need to be doing. We need to be uh, harvesting. We need to be laboring in the Lord's harvest fields. Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are wide already in the harvest. Let's, let's prepare ourselves for harvesting souls. Let's, let's be faithful laborers. And let's not let the day of Christ overtake us as a thief. Let's be ready and watching for his appearing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this Bible study tonight. Thank you for what you've revealed to us in your word. And Lord, I, I, I'm praying you'd help us to be faithful laborers in the harvest. And Lord, that we'd be watching and ready for the coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What an exciting time to be waiting for that last trump to sound. Lord, we love you tonight. Use your word tonight to accomplish what you desire and please. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you this Sunday. And this Sunday, we're going to begin Sunday school at 9.30 for the first time since COVID. So this Sunday, all preschool to high school will be in their classes. We will have a nursery. All adults from college age and up will be in the sanctuary. Uh, Brother Jerry Locke will be teaching during Sunday school. Then in our main service at 1030, Ronnie Warren will be providing special music with his wife. Uh, and 
Uh, then Brother Jerry Locke will be preaching uh, for our 72nd anniversary uh, here at Bible Baptist Church. Don't miss it. We want you to be here. Please be here if you can. If not, don't miss it on the live stream. God bless you.